Good morning and welcome to Behind the Screen. I am Jam and we are here talking about alignment. So Behind the Screen is a show where we just hang out, we talk about games, gaming, game design, game theory, all that sort of thing. And we are going to be looking at what I am calling a series of, let's call it, live essays. Uh, making an argument for alignment. Now, alignment is one of those things that has recently become a, let's call it a source of um, speculation, a, a source of conflict, if you will, um, among people playing in what are really Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons adjacent games. And why is this? Well, for several reasons. One, nobody really seems to want to play alignment. They see it as a, as a restriction, as a, a limit on their character. Uh, may, they may not understand why alignment was or is important in games of epic fantasy or heroic fantasy like we see uh, modeled most keenly by Dungeons and Dragons. You may uh, have heard discussions of things like biological essentialism and then the need to uh, separate this idea of species and alignment. And so we're going to talk about a lot of these over the next couple of episodes. We're just going to look at alignment, where it came from, why it was important, what it does for us, and I'm going to argue why it's still important in our games. So, let's dig in to the origins of alignment. So, alignment was in Dungeons & Dragons from nearly the beginning. Originally, it was much simpler than it is today. Today, we are most all familiar with the 9-axis alignment, even if we don't play... Dungeons and Dragons, right? We see the little memes, right? Lawful good to chaotic evil. There are personality tests that say, hey, what alignment are you? Originally, it was far simpler. As Mark pointed out, good versus evil, law versus chaos. The origins of alignment are actually in its name. So, law versus chaos kind of being the original one. This actually comes not from Dungeons & Dragons, but from the history that the original authors loved. Gibbon talked about law versus chaos. Conan, by Howard, law versus chaos. Law being civilization, that which can be built upon and protects and nurtures, and chaos being survival of the fittest. In certain ways, the original alignment of law versus chaos plays into this idea that either you are working to protect civilization, which is sort of the roles of jackals or adventurers, you are resting comfortably on the benefits of civilization, but won't take an act. You're not actively working to build it up, neutrality. Or secretly, you feel like you should burn it all down and you should be the uh, top ember on the ash heap. Or that you should rule through strength, brutality, chaos. This actually is sort of epitomized in Paul Anderson's Three Swords and Three Lions. We see it a lot in Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion series. These were the foundational views of the original game. Think about it. What do adventurers do? They go, they push back the barbarous, chaotic entities in the wild to make the bastions of civilization safer. It's right there in B2. Keep law, the borderlands, and you go into the caves of chaos. Even the word alignment is something that is indicative of what it's supposed to mean. Which side of the war 
which value principles do you associate with that you are aligned with and here's the thing mark is is right originally chaos was evil but also you have like in paul anderson the elves the fey they are aligned with chaos not so as the game developed we had this well let's talk about alignment languages because that was something that mark brought up yeah there were alignment languages how weird is that except the idea was it was like common all lawful creatures spoke or more importantly understood the concepts of law that they were defending so if you were fighting side by side with a lawful dragon you had the opportunity to speak with it right uh that's a oh, that's a very stoic uh, Marcus Aurelius sort of mindset there, certified to organic. The personal code versus one's passions, or even, you know, an orthodox view, right? Reason versus passion. Although I could say that's probably also a, a very Western Christian view of it as well, reason versus passion. So the idea was you understood on some fundamental level everyone who was on your alignment. Now, by the time we hit 1E, the Law versus Chaos poll had split from 3 into 9. Because there was nuance there. There could be nuance there. Law and Chaos, but Elves aren't necessarily evil. Lawful creatures don't necessarily have to be good. So what was a Spectrum now became this weird three-dimensional space where do we track each other on the the axis of good to evil law to chaos with neutrality kind of moving across the center and again this allowed for more nuance and removed the alignment language thing but again in a game about these mythic journeys these mythic struggles these fairy tales that we tell or that was the foundation it was important to know where things were at and why is this important because alignment is baked into the ontological reality that we play in these games now, you may disagree with me, and that is fine. But I would argue, as my proof of this, the Great Wheel, the planes of existence. Every alignment has a metaphysical font and reality and wars with other metaphysical fonts and realities of other alignments. Demons and devils are both evil. They can't agree on the fact where they're from. Or which evil is best, chaotic or lawful? I agree, John. I would say that Tolkienian elves are far more lawful than they are chaotic. They are just, they have a different view of the world. So this is also a very let's call it a pagan or an old view of the world a pre-christian view of the world that everyone that, that there is no spiritual neutral ground in all things you are either on one side or the other or for or you are against and this is important because we are not playing in a modern world we're not playing in a scientific world if we are playing rules as written epic fantasy games. We are playing in a world where the gods exist. They answer prayers. The planes exist. The war of the factions in Sigil exists. Magic exists. I don't know that I would call you lawful evil, Rook, but I appreciate your distinction there. 
I also personally enjoy using devils more than I enjoy using demons in games. So, what does this mean? This means, in most settings, there's no evolution. Species are created by deities for a specific purpose. We're going to talk about more of this in the next in the next episode, where we talk about the reality of alignment. So, this kind of was baked in to the basic premise of the original fantasy game, the original Dungeons and Dragons. Well, why are we even talking about this? Well, I think... Oh, we should also point out there was a brief attempt, uh, ill-fated as it was in 4th edition, to do five alignments as opposed to nine. Not as weak as three, not as robust as nine, something a little simpler. And in 5th edition, we had... Grab this pencil, because I had an idea. In 5th edition, or 4th edition, we had lawful good, good, neutral, evil, and chaotic evil. So we took the three dimensions and again tried to rotate them into a into a spectrum. I can see why they did that. I don't think it was necessarily as effective as they hoped. So, alignment is one of those things that much like the reality of the gods or the... How do I want to phrase this? The ancient world view, the pre-enlightenment view of species being created for a purpose. That if we pull it out and we suddenly apply our own modern views to things, the game starts to break down a bit. The verisimilitude falls apart. We have to start suspending our disbelief as opposed to diving in and being enveloped. And that's fine. And so let me just say this. If you don't want to play with alignment, don't. In my mind, it just means that things are going to start breaking down a little bit. You're going to start to see the holes left by that Jenga block being removed. And see, I think the chat is pointing out something inherent about this. We all sort of get what our alignment would be in real life. There's just something about us that naturally gravitates towards a description of our lives. I love it, Rook. All right, so let's see here. Uh, Rook said lawful evil. Uh, Restar is chaotic neutral. I would agree. I would agree with chaotic neutral there, my friend. Tink is chaotic good. That feels, uh, that feels spot on as well. And you use lawful evil methodologies to navigate the capitalism of the workplace. Reminds me, Rook, of Birthright when they were talking about what's, what do each alignment's civilizations or settlements look like? And that you may not necessarily be able to tell the difference between a lawful good and a lawful evil society until you break a law. Once you find out what laws exist and what the punishments are for those laws, that's where really the evil and the good can be seen. Uh, I am definitely... Uh, I flip between lawful good and lawful neutral. Uh, certified to organic is, certif is lawful. Uh, John Doom. I remember there's this moment we were at Gen Con. There were six of us. And we were making our way through the rail game area. And we wanted to get out onto the street so that we could go get food. And we got to the end of the exhibitor hall where the rail games were in. And we knew... And on the other side of these set of six or four double doors was the hallway we were looking to get to and beyond that the street but the door said doors must remain closed during convention hours do not use 
So I immediately turn to the right and start heading towards what I can see is the exit. Um, probably 100, 150 feet away, knowing that I'm going to have to walk there, walk around, and come back. And two others of my party went with me, and my wife was like, why are we not just walking through those doors? And the three of us were like, can you read the sign? And the other half of our party uh, just were like, well, we'll see you on the other side. We're not walking all the way around. And they went through, and no alarm sounded or anything. But uh, that was the day that we decided, or we discovered, who in our party was lawful. Who in our party was chaotic. So, these are the origins of alignment. They're based off the fiction, not just the fantasy, not just Conan and Tolkien and Michael Moorcock and Paul Anderson's works that influenced the original design of the game. But these were principles that were established in pre-enlightenment times. These were principles explored by Gibbon in his rise and fall of, or his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The idea that good times or hard times create strong people, strong people create good times, good times create weak people, weak people create bad times. The idea that civilization rises to a point where no one wants to fight for it, they just want to coast and enjoy. And then the barbarians break down the gates, but the barbarians become the new kings. And the cycle begins anew. This is the basis for alignment. And I think it's still built into the fabric of our modern version of Dungeons and Dragons. There are holes that are being poked. People are wiggling at the Jenga piece and a lot of people have pulled the Jenga piece out. And that's fine. But the more you push at the Jenga tower, as you start to move more pieces, the whole thing becomes destabilized. And I think that part of removing alignment has led to a lot of the conflicts and issues we talk about a lot that seem to be obsessed about ad nauseum on commentary shows just like this one. So, when we get back on Thursday, we're going to be talking a lot about what does it mean to play in alignment. So from the player side, what does an alignment mean to you? Why should you look at your alignment? Why should you care? What are the benefits of embracing something like this? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's something I've been noodling about for uh, a very, very long time. Let's see. Some folks may be neutral scaled. I would have walked through the door if no alarm sounded and it was a dumb rule. Um... Paladin notes are a great alignment, Judge, yes. And how strictly you adhere to them. Uh, yeah, John, that's that's the quote. That is also Jurassic Park, Rook. Um, it's a great line from that movie. So, tonight is our the start of our Crucible of Realms game. Um, it's going to kick off with a bang. We're going to start with the Pocket's first reading. Um... And we're going to see if we can actually maybe make the reading rules a little simpler. Uh, Pockets has already drawn his cards. Uh, it is... Whew! It's going to be, uh, right now, the overly ambitious and definitely not savage-minded way I'm looking at these rules. I'm going to have to par them down. Has 144 different interpretations of the cards. That feels like too many. We're going to have to see how it plays out. But as we uh, will simplify through gameplay. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys will join us for this. Uh, we are going to start into this campaign. Um, got a little bit of art changes in the intro trailer. The music, uh, I figured out what was going on when we previewed the trailer and none of you could hear the music. So I'm going to run the trailer here at the end just to show it off one more time. And uh, looking forward to sharing that all with you tonight. So, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. I hope that you guys all get a chance to 
get some good gaming in this week, and if you get a chance, think about alignment. Maybe your own, maybe your characters. And on Thursday, we're definitely going to talk about what the benefits and what the restrictions are of playing your alignment. So until next time, have a good one.